Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Felix Alton Fortin. I'm from University of New York City. As you might tell by my accent, I am French Canadian. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about performing the cloud to teach HPC with Jupyter. Uh, it's a lighthearted presentation. Uh, so feel free to ask me questions that I've not put enough technical details in my presentation. Uh, I'm talking about lighthearted. Uh, I have some mental stimulation for you uh, this morning. I have a question. So why are there more wizards in Harry Potter than in Lords of the Ring? So I would like you to actually think about that question while I present to you my context, and eventually I'll try to answer that question. It is, it is related to Jupiter and what we're doing, I, I assure you. <laughs> uh, so context. Uh, so as I said, I'm, I'm Canadian. Uh, we have something called Compute Canada, uh, which is an organization I actually like exceed that is in charge of providing uh, research, uh, cyber research infrastructures to every Canadian researchers in Canada. So have access to our high performance computing uh, centers for free as it is provided by government centers. Uh, we currently have four uh, sites uh, across Canada, uh, one in British Columbia, two in Ontario, and one in Quebec. And we have one uh, site also in British Columbia that is dedicated to cloud resources. Uh, all of that, so previously, uh, you see on the uh, small, uh, on the map, the small dots are actually sites that provide research support. So the big dots are actually HPC sites, and the small dots are staff like me who provide uh, research on how to use the HPC resources. Uh, now, as part of our mission, we have uh, a goal of actually training researchers on how to use uh, HPC uh, infrastructures. So we are giving around 150 courses a year across Canada. Uh, okay, um, <laughs> most, re most of these courses require access to HPC clusters, and in order to get access to those uh, HPC clusters, you need a Compute Canada account. While those accounts are free, uh, there's some uh, paperwork to fill, and it's a process. So normally people, when they come in and do our training, they don't necessarily have an account. So uh, what we actually came up with was that, well, you, you need some guest accounts, but in order to get guest accounts, I would have to ask a sysadmin two weeks in advance for accounts on my, on my, uh, on my cluster. And that was not cutting it for me. Like it was a too long process. So I started thinking, well, do I actually need a real cluster in order to teach users about programming and about how to use HPC and Slurm? Or should I like make it something else? So could I have at least the software environment available for the users and eventually like just train them on that with the actual real thing. So let's get back to our original question. What is the difference between Harry Potter and Lord of the Ring when it comes to the number of wizards? Does somebody has an answer or an idea? And then that's just a theory. That's just pure nerd. <laughs> All right, so, so my theory is that what is missing in Lords of the Rings are wizardry schools. In Harry Potter, you have all of those schools that teach children how to use magic. Well, HPC for new users is kind of magic, right? So I have a proposition. Um, what I'm proposing is actually to build an HPC workshop platform as a service in order to teach new users how to use our HPC services without having to get them access directly on our HPC cluster. So on the left side is our HPC center at Laval, so it's in a big uh, concrete silo, so we're away from that. And the Soren Tower. Uh, <laughs> and we're trying to go to Oxford, uh, like I near Harry Potter, but you'll see Oxford in that, in, that, uh, in that slide is actually made of Legos. So we are trying to build new Hogwarts out of Legos, uh, just like we would be uh, building new HPC clusters. So, 
uh, my phone. So uh, this is a bit uncharted territory, but if you ever, uh, if you are watching Casey Neistat community's uh, talks, it's a total ripoff of one of his talks. It works. No, really. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is actually launch my HPC platform for training from my phone without actually typing anything on my uh, on my computer on, on my keyboard. Talk to Compute Canada Wizard. Sure, getting the test version of Compute Canada Wizard. Oh, how can I help you? I want to build a cluster. How should your cluster be named? Fernando. Two. How many user accounts should we create? 45. Okay, we want a two nodes cluster named Fernando. It will come with 45 guest accounts. Is this correct? Yes. Okay, your cluster will be available <laughs> in around 20 minutes at Fernando Calcul Quebec Cloud. Thank you for your patience. All right, so now you can. <laughs> all right, so now you, you can you know, you know, you know, you know, say, well, yeah, sure, he talks to his phone. There's, <laughs> there is no HPC cluster built at the moment. I assure you, uh, I'm right. Uh, so, with, in Compute Canada, we have a, as I said, in British Columbia, we have a OpenStack cloud. Uh, what I did through my phone is eventually talk to. Some of uh, to one of my projects that eventually talked to OpenStack. I'm, I'm just going to show you this in a moment. So if I can access my tab, there you go. So this is, was the state of uh, my OpenStack project like a few minutes ago, or actually calling my uh, my computer kind of wizard. I have a big wizard uh, thing team uh, going in that presentation. Now, if I refresh it, as you can see, I have new instances that have been created like zero minutes ago. They are currently being built. So, so if it's working in, in our minutes after this presentation, I can, sh I can show it up to you. And obviously, if I, if I had to, like more than 60 seconds, this demo would not fail. Uh, what is actually that compute kind of wizard? So what I did was essentially just talk to my Google assistant that then talked to uh, the API dialogue flow. So Google is uh, politely providing us a free API in order to talk with a Google assistant. And that Google assistant was then talking to my last API that I've built which was then talking to something called uh, Terraform, and I built a Terraform script. And that's the essential part, actually, of what I'm going to talk to you about today, is just that Terraform project. So Terraform, Terraform is actually just talking to the OpenStack API and create my uh, virtual cluster. So what is Terraform? Uh, so who's familiar in the room, or who's already familiar with, with Terraform? Okay, so be ready to be amazed for those who don't know Terraform. Terraform uh, is a scripting language to define data center infrastructures with a high level language. So it's, a, it's an open source software. It is uh, and it's quite efficient in uh, it's, you, you, with the same kind of language, you can talk with all, any source of REST API as uh, the REST APIs that are provided by different uh, commercial cloud providers. Open stack providers. So on top of Terraform, what I've built is something called Magic Castle. I have an obsession with Magic and Castle. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a Terraform module. So I have a series of uh, Terraform scripts that are eventually wrapped into Terraform modules that we are going to see in the next slide. That first create instances. So at root of HPC cluster, I define what is an HPC cluster as a compute node, a login node, and a management node. So the Terraform script is also in charge of actually creating the volume, so all where the storage is being uh, 
where the data is being written. Uh, the network, uh, the network's ACL, so the firewall, all, all that thing. Eventually also create all of the certificates. So when our Jupyter Hub is uh, being put online, it's already, uh, it always have HTTPS or certificates. It creates a password, a random password for the guest accounts. It creates guest account. It creates truly in 20 minutes all of the essential things that we need in order to teach users uh, HPC. And all of that is actually done directly to input parameters. So when I was talking to my phone, I was just actually giving some of the input parameters that can be provided to my modules in order to create an HPC cluster. So while you don't always have to talk to your phone in order to create an HPC cluster, uh, I'm going to show you first how it, so how does it look uh, technically when, when it comes to uh, the actual infrastructure of the DHPC cluster? So you have your users coming from the internet and they can log in into a login node. And that's a, uh, I would say a free way of describing a login node. That's a very multi-usage uh, login node. So on this login node, you have SSH, you have Jupyter Hub. Yes, the users can log in directly on your Jupyter uh, instance, but that's fine. This is for workshop. This is not production usage. And also, we are creating a global endpoint. So in our HPC workshops, we are actually teaching users how to use uh, Globus. So automatically, through the, uh, uh, through the Terraform provide, uh, provisioning, we are registering automatically a new Globus endpoint that can be used uh, during our workshops. And this is, uh, all of this is done for except for the uh, different accesses. And uh, uh, it is, this, this login node is connected to a sub network that is also shared with our uh, management node on which all of our services uh, that are required inside of our clusters are running. So LDAP uh, through uh, LDAP, uh, so DNS, NFS, all of our stuff, uh, or Slurm CTLD, all that is running directly on a management node. And then you have a series of nodes, so you can create as many computers as you like, as long as you have enough resources. So resources are running, all resources are running a Slurm daemon and a Jupyter single users when uh, it is being launched to the batch partner on the, the Jupyter app. So create a structure. What we provide to the users is a Terraform module that has essentially three components. So our first, it's a, we provide a source or a cloud provider. So Magic Castle actually, yes, it can create an HPC cluster in an open stack, but it can also do it in Microsoft Azure, in AWS, and in Google Cloud. So any actual cloud provider that are available through Terraform can be, uh, and I actually spawn an HPC cluster on. Uh, then we are, can provide a revenue input, so how we want to actually configure HPC cluster, and then uh, the different uh, cloud provider specific inputs. So as I said, our, uh, the source of the, the way that the project is built is that we can use any, almost any of the commercial, major commercial cloud provider by just switching in the source which we want to use as a source for, uh, for a Terraform uh, for Terraform modules. Then we can actually define how we want to name our cluster, just as I did on my, uh, my voice assistant, uh, the number of nodes that we want to build, the number of users, the size of the storage that we want to use, and eventually the public key path to SSH as an admin on the cluster to, uh, to do our stuff. So all of these parameters are shared between all of the cloud providers, and it is, uh, so it is all of the same code in order to actually provision the clusters. So it is not specific those are uh, all independent and then comes the uh, that are specific to a cloud provider so for example the image uh, the virtual machine image that you want to use the kind of instances that you want to use and eventually if you already have different parameters from uh, cloud providers so in uh, the case of OpenStack you allocate floating IPs and associate them directly with your login node so once you have so all of this all of these parameters are being inputted in a text file. Once you have uh, written your, your original text file or your, uh, your call to your modules, all you have to do is call Terraform apply 
So that's what my Flask API was doing. So once the Premiere was posted on the API, it was just calling Terraform apply, creating all of the instances, all of, this, all of the resources. And at the end, it outputs you the different parameters that were generated. So the, uh, the name of the user accounts, the passwords, all of that stuff is directly outputted in the, in the screen. So at the moment, my Google Assistant cannot provide this to me, but it could be uh, looked back in my, in my cell phone. So since we are provisioning from scratch, it takes under uh, around 20 minutes. This is not containers, this is virtual machines, so it's, it's a bit long and through, but still it provides us uh, our needs in around uh, 20 minutes. So we are coming from a Terraform modules that is directly on your laptop that talks then to any of the cloud providers that you've chosen. And finally, the actual provisioning of the nodes are done through Puppet modules. So why Puppet, why not Ansible? Well, we are using Puppet to provision our, uh, to provision our uh, clusters, and I was wishing to actually be able to reuse some of those modules. I was not, but uh, in the end, I might be able to contribute back some of that, some of that stuff. So I, it's a, uh, provisioning is being done through a masterless Puppet architecture, so all the nodes are actually have all of the Puppet code, just apply a site, and the, uh, the application is based on the uh, on the on the node uh, hosting, and eventually provisioning is done in around 20 minutes or so. What we get is essentially a Slurm cluster. Uh, have different configuration available, so the base configuration just come with a Slurm cluster. But as you uh, the other configuration that you you are progressively adding stuff, so global endpoint, and eventually the whole shebang with with Jupyter Hub. And what makes it actually a Compute Canada cluster is its software. So as I said, uh, we have all of these administrative softwares are being installed, but the two key parts are the last two bullet points that would be uh, Compute Canada CVMFS and Alma. So most of you have talked about like, using big images for the kitchen sink problem. Uh, in Compute Canada, we have addressed that issue by actually installing all of our software in one place and then distribute it to all of our cluster to something called CVMFS. So it's a virtual file system that was built at CERN in order to deploy software this way. And uh, that file system can actually be mounted anywhere since essentially it's an HTT endpoint. Uh, we are using that directly in Magic Castle and we are to actually provide over 600 softwares and 4,000, I think, uh, kind of mismatch of compilers and libraries directly on our cluster after 20 minutes. Uh, all of these softwares are not actually being loaded directly on the cluster, so as long as the user doesn't directly call the software, it is not loaded. But once, for example, you're calling Python 3.7 from the modules, uh, fetch to HTTP and maybe available and cache on the cluster. That scientific uh, uh, CVMFS uh, architectures and module is going to be presented at PERT 19 uh, next month. And Compute Canada is eventually in the process of making that repo available publicly. So anyone could actually mount that CVMFS software as all of, uh, in that repo being uh, made available is our open source software that our uh, research analysts have built. Uh, now, once you have uh, access to all of that software, you have, we give it through, uh, we give it, we give access to that software to something called modules or LMOD, and in order to be able to interact with LMOD through Jupyter, uh, build in extensions called originally uh, LMOD, that allow you to a search bar to, H to interact with both different modules directly in Jupyter, modify the environment variable, and then when you launch notebooks, you inherit those environment variables, and you have access to all of the different scientific softwares that you have loaded through LMOD. So you can uh, either, if you launch a terminal after uh, loading the modules, you have access to all of that. So, when we are teaching HPC to users, this is their first uh, kind of interactions with modules. We don't even have to tell them about 
module command that would, they would have to use on HPC systems, we can just show them all the possibilities with modules directly through that search bar. Is this available on Google Lab as well? Yeah, uh, so I only dedicated one slide, but yes, we have an extension, uh, uh, which is a bit pure as it is in tab, and you can, uh, yeah, it's much more powerful in Jupyter Lab. That doesn't work if you've already spawned. Correct. So once you have already spawned your notebook, your environment variables are already set. It so it belong. It it could be made possible, but for now it's just you have to first load more your model and launch your notebook. Uh, still, with that uh, actual uh, development of that extension, I also built a full. An API for that iPod that would allow you to actually load modules through Python directly in your notebook and modify environment variables. But then it would require some programming. But we're we're not actually modifying your your notebook content directly. Uh, also, with Jupyter Helm, we are now able to modify. And some of the Jupyter developer might not uh, like me for that, but we are able to actually modify. Uh, Live, the kernels that are displayed in the uh, available kernels. So, for example, if you only have a Python tree by default, you open the extension, you load Python tree, refresh, you now have the Python tree uh, kernel notebook available. Uh, this is using some normally hidden uh, API in the, in the Jupyter, but it, it works. Uh, now, the second uh, step that I will say in teaching users uh, about HPC, since in the end they will have to be confronted in writing submit script. We are not there yet in just doing interactive HPC. Uh, as Roland has demonstrated, we also have built our small uh, storm form that is automatically uh, updated with the accounts that are available for the users to submit jobs and the different reservations uh, we can uh, Configure when they are notebooks, uh, how many uh, ports do they need, if they need a GPU, uh, do they need, would they be okay with oversubscribed cores, and all that stuff. Uh, we were, uh, so, as for, so I started that last year, uh, and since then we have been using it for three of our summer schools, and all of our workshops are now running directly on top of that. Instead of asking for guest accounts on our uh, uh, on our clusters, so we are doing all sorts of things: introduction to HPC servers, introduction to programming, uh, etc. But this is from the user perspective. Uh, there's also some benefits from the admin side. So since we are a full-fledged uh, kind of HPC environments, we can also teach admins how to interact with Slurm and. How our, our, our environment. So uh, last year, our, we had an intern actually developing all of the software code for the different cloud provider that were not OpenStack. And he talked about himself how HPC actually worked from the inside by developing that. And uh, this summer, we currently, uh, we have a wish to actually be able to provide user feedback on the usage of their jobs. There are Live once their job is finished, we would like to send them an email saying, "Well, you know, you have eight cores, but you only use one. You could uh, do better than that." So we're, uh, we have an interns developing some uh, Slurm plugins that uh, provide Prometheus uh, metrics through Prometheus, and eventually end up in an email. So he's able to actually do that directly, uh, Magic Castle, and modify the setup as as he would like. So key takeaways, if you didn't know about Terraforms, know that it can be used to build complex things, but all of this could be simplified by a single modules. And Magic Castle is a teaching and development that can be used uh, at, at large and where Jupyter is a first class citizen. At the moment, Magic Castle is not yet fully open source. Uh, all of the puppet modules are, but I'm given uh, Feedbacks if you're telling me, uh, Felix, you did ship. Uh, <laughs> I, I won't. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll keep it for us. Uh, 
we're interested, uh, I'll, we had some talk about uh, of uh, could use that for for uh, for integration testing, uh, and it's while it is for now quite Compute Canada specific, all of the actual Puppet provisioning uh, is general. So you could switch out completely the Puppet modules that you're installing, the size and uh, the data of that can be configured directly in the module. All right. I think I'm right on. Yep. It's I'm sorry. It's it's not cloud specific. So okay. So it's, you can do yeah. You can do whatever you like, and you can either order a Domino's pizza to Terraform. It's uh, <laughs> it's it's sort of a joke, but someone actually, as long as there is a REST API, you can develop a Terraform provider for it. Yes. About this or your slides. Is anything available? Uh, everything is on Compute Canada Git. Uh, most of it are publicly available, but I think Google search won't uh, give you any info for now. Yes. Okay. That's fine. Okay. So I guess is the plan to actually get any questions? Is the process of the open source, yep. or is it just that it's? Yeah, for, for now, so everything is in Git. It's just on our handle we'll Git Compute Canada. But my my idea is to make it publicly available once I've cleaned out. Like, yeah. yep. What about uh, first the start cluster? Familiar with yeah. Yes. Uh, not yet, but it could be done. Like uh, the actual, there's some. I I've thought about it, but I haven't done anything in that regard. Like, for example, saving the different modules name in the notebook metadata in order to reload it once you, you, you restart the notebook. I thought about it, but since for now, we are, I think the only one of the few actually are using the LMOD extension, I have any feedback. But yeah, that, that could be useful. How easy or hard is it to change the LMOD extension? That's the wrong question. You should you should use Almod. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, the so um, in order for the extension to actually work, I'm still depending on Almod uh, being able to provide me Python code that I can just directly exec and that's uh, like initiate all the environment variables. Yeah, yeah, if. Uh, once, if you have loaded all of your modules, once you get into terminals, all of the modules are loaded and you, you can use the software directly. Yes? Does loading a module seed the CVMFS cache? And also, how long does that take? Uh, so, the modules, uh, yes, so all of it is like transparent for the users. Uh, it's underneath, it's using AutoFS. So, when you actually access the file, is being fetched and it's quite fast. Uh, so there's a small latency the first time that you actually access the software, but then there's a local cache on the node, uh, and you can actually uh, determine the size of your of your local cache on your node. And uh, does it answer your question? Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, check. If you were to, Terraform can talk to Kubernetes too, it looked like. So yeah. Do you think trying to adopt what you've done here to work in a Kubernetes kind of model would work? Uh, and, oops, sorry. Um, There you go. So th this is the form I talked about. Uh, so it, since I created like 45, uh, I can write the password to it. 
Uh, so it's just so this is a uh, you can you can log on to it just pick one of users and if somebody uh, there's only two nodes but I could add more. Uh, I have uh, I haven't said it but at any point I can actually modify the number of nodes without actually uh, touching the, the entire cluster so if I would like to expand to 10 nodes all I have to do is go in my Terraform script, modify to 10 nodes, do an apply, and Joe is going to create the eight nodes that are missing. And uh, slurp. So I'm doing some uh, black magic with Slurm because normally with Slurm you have to uh, redefine the number of nodes that you are going to use. So I'm just telling him, well, I'm going to use 250 nodes, even if I'm, I'm lying to him. And I'm actually modifying live the slurm.com. Uh, Slurm is not like either, but again, this is not production, and it works. So, um, how many nodes is Jupyter running? Uh, so, the ob is running on the login node, so a single node, but then you're uh, using batch spawner, you can, uh, the uh, single user notebook is going to run on a single node. With the uh, with the amount of resources that you you have to have described in the form, yes, Ian. Can I just check who else is publishing stuff via CDMFS? Are, are other groups doing that? that I think we're interested in. There are, some, for, yeah. there, there are some groups that are now already certain repos. Okay, um, I think we actually have one. Our project that's a Thing. Yeah, we, we have them accessible, but we don't use it to publish our own stuff. Okay. As the end, Germany also has a CVMFS. I'm not the CVMFS expert. I'm just like benefiting from all of the artwork that has been done by, by the guys uh, who are going to present it at PERC uh, next month. So they, are, they have a uh, full eight, eight page papers that were accepted at PERC. So look at this if, you, if you'd like to know more. or. Can, uh, contact me, I can put you in contact with them. Thank you.